Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us at the Smart Quality Summit 2023. My name is Ricky Chase. I am a consultant at R Chase Consulting. Uh, I'm happy to be here today to speak with all of you about CAPA's events and change control and how we can either use those to unlock the potential for continuous quality improvement. A little bit about myself. Um, I came from the Food and Drug Administration where I spent most of my career. I worked as an investigator in the Office of Regulatory Affairs and also worked um, as a director for the uh, investigations branch in Chicago in the United States. And I was responsible for overseeing all of the inspection work and uh, compliance work that was done uh, by the FDA, both foreign and domestic. So I have a lot of experience in dealing with um, CAPAs and change controls and complaints and data and expectations for the industry. And further, as a consultant, I work with my clients to help them meet those expectations and achieve the goals of both, both compliance and running good, solid quality systems uh, for the benefit of their business. So I'm very happy to be here today speaking with all of you. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about um, how certain events relate to corrective and preventive actions. So you'll see the word kappa a lot. Um, we'll talk about the the corrective and preventive action program versus the corrective action and preventive action process. We'll talk about change control and how changes can actually be an outcome of a deviation or a kappa, but they can also be an input into a kappa. And we'll talk about leveraging your data and most importantly, most importantly, excuse me, leveraging your data to create a program of continuous quality improvement on which you can build your business, build your quality system uh, for the benefit of yourself and as well as the patients that you serve. So first, let's start by talking a little bit about how events um, relate to corrective and preventive actions. So how do we define an event? Um, people use different language depending on where you are in the world and which quality system regulations you're, you're required to comply with. But generally speaking, the terms deviation or non-conformance are used interchangeably um, without, throughout the quality systems, or the BISO or MHRA, um, FDA, et cetera. So deviation or non-conformance, um, that is when the outcome is not what you would expect it to be, okay? Or a specification is not met or a process is not followed. This deviation or non-conformance or this event, as we'll call it collectively, can apply to a product or a material, not meeting a specification, the outcome of a result of an analysis, for example, an out of specification test result, or the failure to follow a quality system element or process. And that one's really important because it's often overlooked. If you fail to follow your written procedures, then you've also had an event, a deviation from a written procedure or a non-conformance. So let's see how much you know about CAPA before we get started. So just think to yourself, true or false. CAPA is a process used only to manage complex problems through identifying true root cause and documenting actions taken to correct them. Do we think that's true? CAPA and to manage complex problems, true root cause and documenting actions to correct them. True or false? Well, it's false. So CA and PA, there's corrective action and preventive action. So the key here is that we're identifying true root cause, we're taking corrective actions, but we're taking those to prevent recurrence is what we're trying to achieve. So what we hope to do through our CAPA system is to make sure that those events that have occurred in the past, particularly those serious events or complex events, are not going to continue to occur within our quality system. We can also look at kappa, one word, without the, the hash in between there, as a larger concept. And that larger concept of kappa is the identification, the capture and analysis of your quality data. So we have kappa as a thing, something that you would uh, complete, a corrective action or a preventive action. And then we have kappa as a system, a larger system, which we use to analyze our quality data and we make decisions on that quality data hopefully to drive continuous quality improvement in our quality management system. So depending on if you work in the pharma world or you work in the medical device world, or more and more frequently now, 
if you work in the combination product world, um, you might come across different definitions of what CAPA really is. Now, interestingly enough, if you look at the FDA regulations, and I will say that ISO is better than the FDA in this regard, but with regard to the FDA regulations, the, the human drug GMPs do not even discuss the words corrective or preventing. Um, the human drug GMPs were written um, and promulgated back in the late 70s, and they haven't really been revised since that time. And back at that time frame, these concepts were known and maybe um, inherently built into systems, but they certainly weren't spoken of in a very apparent way. If you look at the, the FDA's medical device GMP, the quality system regulation, which if we'll remember is, is going to be harmonized with ISO 1345, there are multiple instances of the terms corrective and preventive. So depending on which regulation you work under, again, which um, system of compliance you're expected to adhere to, your system may or may not clearly define the terms corrective and preventive. But nonetheless, all of the regulations globally have an expectation that you identify quality problems and that you take actions to correct those and that you take actions to prevent them from recurrence. So it doesn't really matter what we call them or which part of the regulation may or may not apply. The concept is the same and it's both good business and a requirement regardless of the market um, that you're currently working in. So let's talk a little bit about a CAPA program versus a CAPA process. So a CAPA, C-A-P-A -A, with a slash in between a corrective action or a preventive action, okay, is discrete. It's usually referred to as its own event or as its own record. Um, we opened a CAPA. CAPA, all one word, is a concept. It's a concept of a system that builds on that continuous quality improvement. But what does that system really require to be effective? It requires that your data be defined. So you must first define which data points will we be looking at? What will we capture, okay? And then we have to analyze it. It doesn't do any good to capture data if we're not reviewing it and thinking about it in a strategic way to understand what it really means. So we have to define it, capture it, and then we have to analyze it in a meaningful way. Once we analyze that, it's expected that we'll react to it. Now, sometimes our reaction is, that's great information. I don't see anything of risk or importance. Today, I'm not going to do anything. Sometimes that reaction needs to be, okay, now I see some signals that maybe we're starting to have some problems. Hopefully we find things before they happen. And we need to take an action to prevent bad things from happening or from our quality system, getting a little askew and moving away from where we'd really like it to be. So we have to react to the data signals. And then the last thing we have to do is we have to have evidence that whatever action we do take in response to our data signals has an effective um, response. So we wanna make sure that whatever we do is effective and prevents recurrence or in the case of a preventive action, prevents an event from occurring in the first place. So what does change control have to do with any of this? Well, change control is a really important concept as it relates to CAPA, and oftentimes change control is thought about in a very different way, almost in a vacuum of information removed away from the corrective and preventive or event management systems. Um, Change control is almost always a necessary output of an event or a CAPA. Um, usually, if you're going to prevent a recurrence of something or you're going to prevent an undesirable situation from occurring in the first place, you need to change something. You need to change something to be different than what the current state is in order to correct it or prevent it. So in order to change something, we need a very strong change control system. That change control system is important because it documents the action that we've taken, um, the change that we've made to our quality system so that we can monitor and track that change, not only to show that the change was effective, but very importantly, to show that the change did not 
unintentionally impact something else in our quality system, which has now caused a different problem to occur. So tracking and managing our changes is very important. It's also important to note that change can become an input or a root cause of an event or a kappa. Sometimes we take changes and maybe it's not as part of a kappa. Maybe we change a supplier. No problem with the supplier, supplier's just not available anymore. So we change our supplier. Our change control is important to make sure that when we change that supplier, we do so appropriately. If it turns out that in changing that supplier, we've now created a problem with either supplier quality, um, supplier material availability, et cetera, then that change in and of itself can become a root cause to an event or to a corrective action. Changes can be temporary uh, where risk can be adequately controlled. And you're going to hear a lot about risk. Risk is incredibly important. So everything that we do should be commensurate with risk and based on risk understanding. Changes can be temporary, meaning we were using supplier A, we always use supplier A. We temporarily need to use supplier B. What is the risk in doing that? If you have a supplier management system where supplier B is already qualified, they're not your preferred provider, maybe because of cost or logistics, um, then changing to supplier B is a pretty low risk activity because you've already qualified them as a provider. Now, if you were to change to supplier B and supplier B was not qualified or you had no history with them, the risk would inherently be higher because you don't know the quality of the materials that they're um, providing to you. So you have to look at changes, um, particularly temporary changes, and understand the risk associated with those. Most changes, however, are permanent and they're actually taken um, as a means to seek to improve a procedure, a process, a design, a material, something of that nature. Okay, so now we understand what an event is. We know a little bit about CAPA and CAPA, and we understand a little bit about how change relates to events and CAPAs and the CAPA system. So how do we use that information in order to drive continuous quality improvement for our quality management system? <clears throat> well, the answer is in the data. The answer is always in the data. Anytime you're audited, what is the auditor looking for? They're looking for your data. They're looking for your records. They're looking for your information. And what you know is that the outcome of your audit is often driven by the quality of the data that you present to the auditor. That is no different than the quality of the data that you present to yourselves internally when making good internal decisions on how to continuously improve your quality management system or how to identify problems before they occur or correct them after they do. It's important to know that the results of your continuous quality improvement plan are only as good as the data that you rely on. So it's really important that you identify your quality data sources. Again, you have to define by procedure, how will you analyze the data? And then you have to ensure that you take an appropriate and timely reaction to the data. So appropriate and timely. Appropriate meaning we've really evaluated what action we're going to take in response to the data. Um, that those actions are, have been evaluated for impact to make sure that we're not going to adversely impact something else. We've um, analyzed the risk associated with whatever action we're going to take uh, to make sure that if there are new risks to be introduced, that we will adequately control those. And then timely is very important. Um, you know, frequently we see individuals write into their quality system documents that they have 30 days to do something or they have 60 days to do something. And what does an auditor love to do? They love to find out where you didn't meet your own timeline, right? You're overdue. Um, so I caution you about, you know, drawing a line in the sand or taking a hard stance on a 30 day, 60 day, 90 day reaction. You can have targets. Those are good goals to have. Again, I'm going to keep coming back to the timeliness of your reaction being tied to the risk of the event that you're actually dealing with. So if you're seeing data, which indicate that, you know, there may be harm to patients in the field, 
obviously your reaction should be more timely. It should be happening right now, very soon, uh, maybe even with interim controls put in place. However, if you're seeing something that has very low patient risk, very low impact to product, um, it's still a problem. Maybe it's a technical deviation from the regulation. Um, then you have a little bit more time to react to that. Okay, so how can we help, you know, identify what our data really are? Again, you know, the regulations um, do not explicitly identify what your quality data are. Everybody's business is different. Everybody's process is different. Um, your products are different. And you need to identify what the quality data are that are meaningful to you and to your quality system. <clears throat> now, FDA has given you a little bit of help. Um, if you want to look there for some thoughts about what quality data may include. Um, and their regulation says that you're required to analyze processes. So manufacturing processes, inspection processes, work operations. Um, that's individual tasks that perhaps you do. Concessions. Uh, concessions would be um, like those temporary changes, right? deviating from a process knowingly, not after the fact, identifying that, but knowingly moving away from what you would normally do um, to do something else temporarily. Quality audit reports, that would be both internal audit reports, um, external audit reports, supplier audits. Quality records, well, everything in a, in a GMP system is a quality record, right? So looking at your quality records, that might be your batch records, um, your device history record might be your risk management file. Um, service records, if you happen to make a product which requires servicing. Uh, complaints, obviously, looking at post-market experiences. Um, I would put into that adverse events, um, expected and unexpected, serious adverse events, um, medical device reports, uh, field alerts, returned products, okay? Um, and then other sources of quality data. Now, if you happen to have product in the US market, if you happen to fall under the quality system regulation, um, other in FDA's language means anything you should have been analyzing, but you were not. Um, that, that can be very subjective. Um, what you need to think about is, are there things that FDA may identify as far as data go that would indicate that we're having a negative shift away from our, our quality parameters? And they would say, well, you should have been watching that. Um, so others a big work. So you need to take the time to do a good job and identifying what those quality data points will be that you're going to define and capture and analyze in response to, okay? The whole point of doing this again is to identify existing quality problems and potential quality problems, which can lead to a deviation or non-conformance can lead to problems with products or other quality problems, including process problems, material problems, supplier problems, et cetera. Okay, so again, you know, in the pharma world, not well-defined. Um, even if you look at the Q documents from ICH, again, not necessarily well-defined. Um, however, it is recognized as best practice to do this, and it is expected that you will monitor your quality system and you will re respond to changes in your quality system, which indicate that you're shifting away from the desired state. Again, something to think about while you're sitting there uh, watching the presentation. Um, what would you say if somebody asked you, I feel confident that our event management CAPA system and change control systems work together to create continuous quality improvement. How confident do you feel about that? If you are a, a quality manager, quality supervisor, VP quality, even if you work in operations because quality is everybody's responsibility, do you have confidence that your systems work together to really drive continuous quality improvement? And I keep coming back to continuous quality improvement because this isn't just about meeting uh, the, the need of the regulation. Um, that's the bare minimum, right? The bare minimum is doing what you're told to do. Um, good quality and good business is always striving for continuous quality improvement. Um, continuous quality improvement keeps your patients safer, 
It saves you money. Um, it's the right thing to do. So ask yourself that question. How confident do you feel? So what are some of the pitfalls of your data? I mean, there's a good and a bad. There's two sides of the coin, as they say, to everything. Um, too many versus too few. What does that mean? Well, if you have an overabundance of data points, okay, you could spend your lifetime analyzing them all. Um, you can't get through it all. You can't analyze them with any meaning if you are collecting you know, a thousand different data sets per month, a hundred different data sets per month, 50 different data sets per month. How many are too many? What's meaningful and what is not, okay? If you have even 50 data sets per month, how well can you see across those data sets, not just within them, but across them to see how they're interconnected? On the other hand, if you're not collecting enough information, right? then you're not capturing signals, you're not identifying potential problems, and you, you don't really have the information that you need on which to base those improvements, let alone on which to base preventive actions or to identify when you need to take a corrective action. What if your data are not granular enough? Um, you lack specifics, you only have generalizations. I'll give you a for instance on this. If all you look at are the number of complaints received per month, that's just a number, okay? You can say, we had more complaints this month than we had last month. We had fewer this month than we had last month, okay? If you're not looking at product-specific complaints or even within the product-specific complaints, if you have multiple formulations, multiple packaging um, configurations, um, if you have, you know, different equipment that you use to manufacture, even different formulations, you need to think about how specific do you need to be in the data that you're looking at so that you can actually draw some conclusions. However, you have to be careful. While you want to have the granularity so that you can identify um, the, the small threads that might run through your data, you also need to take a step back and look at the 10,000 foot level and make sure that you're examining what the bigger picture might be. Do you have systemic level signals that need to be recognized? For instance, if you review, if you randomly audit your complaints once a month just to check for quality behind the quality reviewer and you, you look at those across all product portfolios, and you understand that it doesn't really matter if it's reviewer A or reviewer B or reviewer C, we are continuously missing um, how well we do root cause analysis, then that's a systemic problem. It's not a person problem. It's not a product problem. That's a systemic problem. You have a problem with understanding how to do root cause analysis. So again, it's a balance between how having enough information to really understand what's happening in your quality system, but don't forget to take a step back and look for those systemic level issues that might be there. Another problem, lack of acceptance criteria. Um, acceptance criteria, not knowing when the data shows the response is required. So, you know, if your acceptance criteria is so low, it's, mm, we, you know, it's less than what it was. Well, how much less? Is it 10% less? Is it 5% less? Is it 1% less? Um, what is the real acceptance criteria? And more importantly, does the acceptance criteria that you establish even have value? Is it quality indicating? Um, if you set acceptance criteria, which are not based on risk or historical performance, then you end up with too much. You end up with too much work. Um, or maybe sometimes not even enough work. It depends. So it's really important that you understand what you're basing those accepting criteria on. If your historical performance says, for this product portfolio, we know that we routinely get about 10 to 15 complaints per month, right? When we distribute our normal volume. Um, and, you know, that's, that's about normal for what we see, 
Okay. If in a month, the next month, you all of a sudden get 150 complaints, hopefully that's apparent enough that you start asking some questions, right? Um, but understanding what your historical performance is is really important. Uh, also basing it on risk. Uh, do we want to be spending a lot of effort on an extremely low risk item? Um, we probably don't. We probably want to make sure that we review it. We want to try to address it. But, you know, do we need to spend, you know, months and months of resources on very low risk problems? Probably not. So using your resources appropriately will help you find that balance. So you have to describe by procedure how you will analyze the data, okay? So you have a lot of data points and you need to use tools to be able to see the patterns and the interconnectivity between the data sets, okay? So you need to use some tools and you need to describe what tools you will use, all right? You can employ very strong statistical techniques, particularly if you're noticing a, um, an adverse you know, shift in your quality management system so for example, if you're looking at um, complaints and you're looking at complaints for a specific product and you can see that the complaints are going up, you do something very simple like a Pareto analysis, right? Um, and the Pareto analysis makes it very apparent that you're having this kind of like, you know, upward shift in the number of complaints that you're getting on a product. Well, when you start looking into that, you might start looking at things like, well, did we have a supplier change? Did we have um, a process change? Did we have an equipment change, okay? You can take that information. You can also take other data sets that may be having a shift as well and compare them together in analysis of variance or covariance to tell how far you are from your actual norm or if two shifts seem to be related to one another, okay? So there are very strong statistical techniques that you could use in order to see if things are interrelated. You also must have a defensible method. So what does that mean? Most people will tell you that you can find a tool, specifically a statistical tool, um, which you can apply to a set of data that will tell you what you want it to tell you. So. If you're going into this process um, hoping to get an outcome from your analysis that says there's no problem, we don't need to take an action, then you're probably going to do an analysis which tells you that there's no problem, we don't need to take an action, okay? But that's not the goal. The goal is not to say we don't have problems, we don't need to take actions. The goal is to use a tool or an analysis method which gives you truth. And truth in data is which is what allows you to prevent problems, to respond quickly to problems that maybe you weren't seeing before they become disastrous and become something like a death or patient injury or recall, which will damage your business. So make sure that you're being smart about how you demonstrate that the tool or the analysis that you're using gives you truth in your outcomes or in your information on which you're basing your decision. Most auditors are very good at looking at the way that you analyze your data and understanding if you adjusted your data analysis to give you the answer that you wanted. Okay, when to respond? Well, you have to respond to the data, we've said that. The key here is to take early action, okay? You want to try to prevent things from happening. It's really important. Prevent the problem before it occurs. Preventing problems also leads to that continuous quality improvement, right? We don't want to be reactionary all the time. What happens if we respond late? Well, if we're responding late, something bad has already happened. It's because you either didn't identify those early signals. You just missed them. Okay. Um, or... Now you found them and now you have an event or a non-conformance or a deviation. And now you've got an entire event and investigation that brings that problem forward. When you miss those early signals and you end up in an event or non-conformance investigation, your 
time, your effort, your resources has now gone up exponentially because now you're having to look at the impact of products on the market as opposed to preventing that product, which may have that problem from ever getting to the market. So your impact can be wider, your risk is higher, and certainly the outcome could be more costly. You need to have very clear rules for when and how to respond, okay? Again, describe by procedure. All of this should be proceduralized. If you overreact to your data, you will overburden your CAPA system. You will have people doing CAPAs day in, day out. Um, you will find yourself getting behind on your target timelines. It will be a very bad look when somebody asks you why a CAPA has been open for a year or two years, and that actually happens. Um, so you don't wanna overburden your CAPA system. If you have an underreaction, okay, then, you know, or your, your system is too complex, um, or system-wide changes are consuming time and resources. That's what happens. So if you have an underreaction, then you have problems occurring. And when you have a lot of problems occurring, you're consuming time and resources. And again, you're chasing problems which have already probably made it into the field. So, or into the marketplace. So you don't wanna underreact also. That's why defining these rules ahead of time is really important. Okay, how do we drive continuous improvement? We identify our data or our key performance indicators, okay? And we feed them into our CAPA system. We look at what our data sources are. So what could our data sources be? Um, here's a list of some, this isn't all. These are things that you can think about. Um, very common ones, deviations, nonconformance, audit outcomes, OOSs, services that you perform, how much service are you performing? How much return are you getting? Here are some things we didn't talk about before on the previous slide. Rework. How much rework are you having to do? If you're having to do a lot of rework in your production process, something's going on in your production process. Either that or there's something going on with your materials. So monitor how much rework is normal for your system. If this number is going up, that's an indicator something's going on with materials or processes. Changes. If you're making an inordinate number of changes to a quality system, particularly if these are reactive changes, that's an indicator that something's not right in your quality system. One thing to really pay attention to on changes, and this is key to how this fits in the CAPA, if you are continuously changing the same thing over and over and over again, you didn't get to the root cause, you didn't solve the problem. So if you are continuously changing a material, because it doesn't meet specification, something's wrong. You didn't get to the heart of the matter. Look at your scrap. A lot of people are like, scrap doesn't matter. That's not a quality indicator. That's a money issue. Um, it's not just a money issue. If you're not doing rework because you don't have a validated rework process, which rework has to be validated unless it can be 100% verified, then it goes in the scrap bin. So if it's not happening here, it's happening here monitor your scrap. You know what your historical loss is, okay? That's money. Everybody tra tracks that because it's money out the door. If that number is going up, there's something going on. Again, material or process. Or maybe new equipment is damaging your product, or maybe you've had high turnover. So that's why turnover is on here. Employee turnover is key to quality. Um, we wanna keep employees that are quality-minded, uh, whether they work in operations or they work in the quality unit or they work in dot control, it doesn't matter. We want to keep good, solid employees that have historical knowledge that we've trained to operate within the parameters of our quality system because they're, they know, they know the history, they know what to look for, they know when problems are arising, and they know the work that you've done in the past to try to solve them. So turnover is something that is frequently not looked at, but it's really a key indicator of what might be going on in your quality system. So we collect these data and KPIs, and then we have to analyze it. We've talked about that. Some things that we could do, we could do Pareto analysis, we could do pivot tables. Again, we could do analysis of variance, analysis of covariance. Our problem should be, you know, what, what kind of analysis we do should be based on our data. What are we really trying to get at? More complex issues, <clears throat> pardon me, ANOVAs and COVAs. Pivot tables and Pareto's are very normal. 
uh, something that everybody should expect to see and do. Then we have to react to it. And how do we react to that? Uh, we, we look at our quality management system. We probably need to make some changes and we may or may not need to open a corrective or preventive action. <clears throat> Pardon me. Okay, so understanding impact. Impact is also key. So make sure that when you're thinking about um, an identified potential problem or realized problem, what else could be subject to the same event? So again, we're talking about continuous quality improvement. If the issue or event or potential problem um, applies to one thing, we'll call it A, and we fix it to address its impact on problem A, but we never ask the question, could it also be impacting B, C, and D, then we've missed our opportunity to prevent problems there as well. And the solution to the same problem may look different particularly if we're dealing with product issues. So what we need to do with product A and product B and product C might be very different um, and might still be related to the same problem. So we need to understand the impact to make sure that we're taking um, systemic actions where those are necessary. For example, could more than one lot of material be impacted? Maybe we scrap that lot, okay, fine. What about the other lots that are already on the market? What about the ones being manufactured behind them? Initial impact assessments need to be very timely. You need to determine what immediate corrections need to be taken. So if you identify a problem through your data analysis um, and it is a, a high risk problem, a critical problem, you probably need to take an immediate correction, either an interim control to stop it from continuing to happen where you take a corrective action um, or you, you need to stop doing what you're doing, okay? Um, but you also need to do a follow-up impact assessment. Once you've identified the root causes, you need to go back again and ask, based on what those root causes are, are there other things that could be impacted that we hadn't originally identified? Usually, the more impact, uh, the more expansive the actions that are, are necessary to be taken. You need to make sure you're always considering the impact along with risk. So risk is something that we need to be thinking about at all times. I said that earlier. So the risk of the event is key to success. All things commensurate with risk. When you respond based on risk, then you appropriately apply your resources. Resources are always short. So you wanna make sure that you're putting your resources where they're value added um, to hopefully preventing problems when necessary correcting problems. We don't want to be chasing and spending a lot of time and resources on low risk items, okay? That's not how we get to continuous quality improvement. You need to balance that event management, right, with your CAPA management. If you have a deviation nonconformance, that doesn't mean it needs to be elevated to a huge CAPA action where you're, you know, you're investigating the world, okay? If it's a, a relatively low or low to medium risk event or nonconformance, deal with it within the event or nonconformance, figure out why it happened, correct it, take a corrective action and move on. Those things occur when something bad has already happened, okay? Use your CAPA system, the bigger system for bigger problems to really deal with those critical things, the high risk things, um, to prevent critical problems and to tackle long-term things maybe that are more systemic in nature, okay? Make sure that as part of this data analysis, that the data is actually updating or improving your quality system. So when you use a risk management program and you've already taken the time up front to identify the risks that occur with products and processes, and you've identified those risks as low, medium, or high or critical, and you go back to that risk management file when you're analyzing your data and you go, okay, if this happens, We've already said, here's the potential outcomes of that. Therefore, it's a high risk or a critical risk and we need to respond to it right now, okay? Make sure that you're monitoring the data, you're monitoring events, you're monitoring nonconformances, you're monitoring corrective and preventive actions because that will tell you if the risk you originally assigned to an event or to a product or to a process 
needs to change. Maybe that risk isn't as high as you thought it would be. Maybe you're not getting any signals of risk associated with that process, okay? But maybe what you're finding is that that process is much higher risk than you originally thought it would be. Maybe you're having a lot of events. Now you're having some systemic issues associated with a product or a process that you need to address. So always go back to the risk management file and make sure that your risk management program and files are updated, you know, both up and down to adjust that risk. Again, if you can lower the risk based on data and you can defend that, fewer resources go to that. Now you've got resources to go to the more critical higher risk opportunities. Be proactive, okay? Manage your risk through a risk management program. It's part of a continuous quality improvement. It helps you make faster decisions and it helps you use your resources where they're best served. Again, look at your change control data. I said this before, understand how many changes you're having, what was changed, why was it changed. Also keep in mind that if you're having temporary changes, and I don't like the word temporary deviation, because deviation really conceptually is something that you identify after the fact. You didn't do something you should have done, okay? Whereas a temporary change is before the fact, you knowingly and willfully are, are having a temporary change to a process, product, or material based on impact and risk assessment, okay? And the key there being temporary. Look at the number of temporary changes you have. If you're continuously implementing a temporary change, we're gonna do this for one lot. We're gonna do this for three lots. We're gonna do this for five lots. And then you come back and you're doing it again, and then you're doing it again, and you're doing it again. Then that should have been a systemic change. That should have been a permanent change. And you're not managing your change control properly. That's why that data is really important. You need to make sure your changes are being managed in a proper, proper way. If you have too many changes, you have a lack of control. If you have too many temporary changes, then something's inadequate. You shouldn't have a bunch of temporary changes, either your procedure, process, material, design, something's going on there. So you need to monitor those, okay? If you're changing the same procedure every three weeks, every three months, you don't have the process down. You need to go back and look at the process. Um, if you're changing the same thing for the same reason, multiple times, you, you didn't didn't solve the problem. You didn't find a systemic issue. Um, if you're not having changes, if we look at your change control system, if I look at your change control system and you have like two changes in a year, um, you're either not documenting, identifying and documenting the changes properly, or you're not making improvements to your quality management system. And those are both bad things. So we should expect to see changes if for no other reason as preventive actions and for uh, quality system improvements. And again, don't forget to update that risk file, okay? So again, you know, these are, this is not the, the list. These are just ideas. How many events per month are you having? What's the average? Are there spikes in the rate of occurrence? What kinds of events are you having? Are there commonalities? Do they share processes, people? Are they, are they across a single product? Um, did the event happen after a change? How many are you seeing that are low, medium, and critical risk? If you have a high number of critical risk um, events, that's a big problem. Your company's at risk, your quality system's at risk, your product's at risk. How many events do you have versus the number of actual CAPA actions? If you have a, hard, a high number of events and a low number of CAPA, you might be missing trends. Um, you might be downplaying the risk of an event. High risk events need to be elevated to a kappa because they need to look more systemically and they take a, a bigger investigation. Um, if you have a high number of events and a high number of kappas, again, maybe you're not using risk management properly. Um, your cap, the kappa system, right, um, really is there to look at systemic and serious manners. Uh, everything else should be handled directly within the event nonconformance or deviation. If your event root cause is frequent and repetitive, then you have a systemic problem and you fail to take effective corrective and preventive action. If you keep coming back to training, something's wrong. Either training's not the root cause or you didn't fix your training program or you didn't fix your people, okay? 
If you fail your effectiveness checks, um, it means you didn't identify the true root cause, or you may have missed all of the potential root causes. Most often, problems do not occur due to a single root cause. Most often, it's a combination of multiple root causes. And oftentimes, when you don't dig deep enough to identify true root cause, you miss those, and therefore, you continue to have problems. Again, update your risk files. I've provided for you some additional KPIs. Um, complaints and events, you know, root cause codes are really important. What I will caution you against is making sure that you're consistent in how you apply root cause codes and how you define and apply problem codes. You cannot define multiple codes in the same manner or it dilutes your data. It makes it looks like, look like your problem is not there or doesn't exist. Be cautious of that. Make sure you're not doing that. Look at how many you get right first time. Is your effectivity rate high? You're almost always successful in your um, reactions. Okay. Again, look at your change controls. We talked about that. We talked about rework and scrap and why that's important. Um, audit findings are really important. If you have a lot of external audit findings and supplier audit findings, but your internal audit findings are very low, then you're not finding the problems that everybody else is finding. And you need to ask why. Okay. Supplier corrective actions, making sure you're keeping your suppliers in check will help prevent problems within your own shop. And don't forget things like environmental conditions and data, training. It's important to know that your people are trained. Uh, training is seldom the right answer or only right answer to a corrective action. I recommend that you don't define trend. It can be difficult to, um, to define. Look at using your data to build your historical norm and document your historical norm. Look for movement away from the norm to indicate a negative shift in the QMS. If you use the word trend, you must define it and it must be, must be statistically significant and you're going to have to prove how it is or how it isn't, okay? Um, so be careful in how you use those words. Choose useful tools. We've talked about that. We've also talked about making sure you understand those interrelationships. Complaints increase after introducing a new supplier. Rework increases when a second shift is initiated. Um, minor internal audit findings, major external audit findings. Um, events go up after changes are made or you have a preventive maintenance or equipment or facilities are shut down. Make sure you're looking at those interrelationships when you're looking at events and you're looking at corrective actions and continuous quality improvement get to the relationships between the elements of the quality system, look for those problems to prevent them before they occur. And bringing it all together, <laughs> make sure that your risk management plan is a living document, update it based on your data. Use that to manage your resources. Use that to manage your risk decisions. Some risks are greater, um, than others, use your resources where the risk is greater and document why you're doing that. Use your knowledge and your learnings to drive continuous quality improvement and make sure that your risk management plan is product focused, but also process focused and also systemically focused. Look across your quality system elements to make sure you understand where your greatest risk of failure is. Present your quality data and your quality data analysis and outcomes to the full organization. This is important because it helps drive improvements and it creates ownership. Promote your atmosphere. The atmosphere is one that encourages bringing forward potential or realized problems. It shouldn't be blaming people. It shouldn't be penalizing people. The focus should be on strong root cause analysis and finding lasting solutions. And when you've done this properly, your continuous quality improvement program can be used to build standards of work. And when following those standards of work, you create consistency in processes and reduce events and non-conformances. So I hope that you have found this helpful today. Um, hopefully you've learned one thing that you didn't know before, or you've had something that you could think about uh, that might help you in the work that you do going forward. 
The final question is true or false. Quality is the responsibility of QA, quality assurance, and QC, quality control. I'm hoping that all of you know the answer to that, whether you work in quality or elsewhere. And the answer is false. Quality is everyone's responsibility. So thank you again for joining today. I hope that you found this helpful. I wish you well, and I think we will take some questions and answers now. Thank you, Ricky, for these invaluable insights. And uh, if you just joined us, uh, a warm welcome to you. I would uh, like to encourage you to ask your questions. Also, during this Q&A with uh, Ricky, you can still ask questions uh, for her. So, uh, but before we delve into the Q&A, first a little poll and uh, you can scan the QR code here and go to the polls. Just add your name and choose the right answer which is most appropriate to you and then we can uh, take it from there. So the first question and uh, I'm very curious to see it with you. I don't know if, uh, yes, we will have a look at it immediately. All right, here it is. First question, risk is not important when considering how to respond to your quality data. True or false? And while you are answering, Ricky, you are calling in from Boston, is that correct? Yes, yes. Hi, hello everybody. All right. Uh, and so far, 92% is uh, answering false. Is that something that surprises you, Ricky? Uh, no, and gratefully, it, it doesn't surprise me. Um, the fact that everybody knows that risk is really the driver for your quality system management is, is really great to see. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, we wait just a few more moments to get your votes and to see if that is still the same result. So far, 92%. I will close the votes in a second. Okay, and uh, apparently it's still the same answer. So, um, not surprising at all. Good, second question. Let's have a look at the second question. There's always a bit of a delay, sorry for that. Okay, here it is. Only leadership needs to know what the quality data are indicating. True or false? Mm. I think that's an easy one, isn't it? <laughs> we hope so. Oh, uh, <laughs> everyone won that one. <laughs> well, luckily, 100% uh, of you guys says false. If there is somebody uh, not agreeing to that, please raise your voice. Uh, I would be uh, curious to know who that is. Uh, but indeed, not surprising, I believe. Um, okay, Ricky, would you like to make any other comments on that? Or should we proceed to the Q&A? No, this is, this is really great. Um, I'm glad that the majority of the audience knows the key takeaways of the presentation and hopefully that's what they're practicing in their day-to-day -day business. Yeah. All right. So first question from Manon de Couilleur. We have implemented the CAPA program, including defining data and analyzing as part of the management review. Recorded CAPAs are indeed only single projects. How do we address this? Okay, um, a couple of points then. Um, it's great that you're identifying CAPA as a program that feeds into your management review. 
as long as your management review is frequent. So unfortunately, in many organizations, management review in the true technical term is something that's only done once or twice a year. And that is not frequent enough for you to really understand what's happening in your quality system. Um, now, if you do this monthly, that's great. So, so that's fine. Um, but CAP is just as large projects conceptually can be misleading. Um, it really can be small items. It can be a one-off occurrence of something that is of extremely high risk. So uh, one of the examples I'd like to give is that if you have, if you start seeing serious patient injuries, even if it's one or two, right, those are very serious events. And those oftentimes need you to dig deeper and take a more systemic and holistic look at what's happening in your environment. Most of those things are not tied to one mistake or another. So um, it's important that you take a step back and really ask yourself, what are your quality data? What are you trying to learn and understand? And are you not seeing something that you should be seeing because you're wrapping everything up only in large projects? Okay, all right. Thank you for this uh, elaborated answer. Next question from uh, Sneha Kalburgi. I hope this is correctly pronounced. If the supplier is qualified and they provide a COA that does not meet specifications, how do we implement change control to this scenario? Again, another excellent question. So ultimately you're responsible for your, your supplier. Um, you you should have strong quality and supplier agreements with those organizations. And in those agreements, you should state clearly what your requirements are for acceptability. If your supplier is not meeting your needs for your quality system acceptability, you either need to negotiate it with that supplier or you need to find a new supplier. Ultimately, regardless of which regulatory system you work in anywhere in the world, you're going to be held accountable for what your supplier does and what they provide to you. So you need to negotiate that with them and get what it is that you need to, uh, to correctly support your quality system. Yeah. All right. Clear answer. Thank you. Uh, Benjamin Yerk. Uh, again, thank you, Benjamin. Regarding large data sets, to which extent can you use AI for pre-analysis? As I see it, that should be allowed, right? Um, wow, that is a fantastic question. I'm really glad you asked that. So here's the thing. AI is so new conceptually in terms of quality and impact quality, right? So one of the questions that you would, you would probably be asked is AI is like any other quality software that you use. So if you're using a software which helps you make decisions about your quality system, it needs to be validated. So how are you validating your AI tool? That's yep. the question you'll be asked. If you validated your AI tool, then sure. Yeah, absolutely use it, right? Um, if you haven't, you need to be very cautious about that. Indeed, there's uh, so many aspects of AI. <laughs> Precaution uh, so far. Chantal van Gorp. Do you think a positive shift could also mean there is an event going on? Maybe deviations are not documented anymore. That would look like something in the numbers, but it's not. 100%. So you also need to be cautious about that. This is a perfect example, and I'm so glad you asked that question. So if you've had, for instance, a very large number of events, say in 2022, all of a sudden in 2023, those events seemingly disappear and you can't figure out why. You didn't make a change in material, you didn't make a change in process, you didn't um, change your supplier, you didn't do anything seemingly that would have suddenly caused a drop in a negative indicator. You need to understand why, because sometimes the reason why you're seeing improvement is because people quit writing it down and that can't happen. So yes, positive and negative trends that are extreme, you need to be addressing those. Excellent question. All right. Um, okay, another question. Do you always have to have an effectiveness check? If not, what are some instances where you would need a kappa? Okay, so, if, so effectiveness checks, whether you're working in like the larger 
concept of a complex kappa for a project, something like that. Or even if you're just dealing with a single event, okay? It's expected that if you take an action, you will evaluate the effectiveness of that action. That is a routine expectation. Now, there are some instances where you have an event, but the corrective action is very apparent. It's very simple. It's, it's just abundantly clear. So when you can document that the uh, remediation for whatever that event is, is so obvious that you can look at something and know that it was effective, right? You can verify that X was done. You don't need to have an elaborate effectiveness check. Just like the corrective action itself or the preventive action itself should be commensurate with the risk, the more complex the action you take, the more likely it is that you're going to need to have an in-depth effectivity check to make sure that you haven't implemented new problems um, and what you've done is really solve the problem. Don't make it harder than it has to be, but document why you don't do things. All right. Thank you. Maybe, I don't know if we have time for one last question. I'm just checking uh, at the technique. Um, okay, just one more question. Um, what do you do if you uh, sorry, what do you do if you do not have reliable data to establish your historical norm on which to establish action limits or trends? Sure. So in a lot of instances, um, if you're a new company, for instance, you don't have historical data. If you've had a non-compliant or a struggling quality system, perhaps your quality data are not even reliable. So you don't want to be basing decisions on that. You need to start anew and go forward. One of the things that you can do is you can use open data sources. So there are a lot of databases out there, for instance, in the FDA world, you can look at adverse events database. You can look at reportable events. You can look at SAEs. Um, other things that you can do is you can look for peer-reviewed studies. So there are peer-reviewed studies out there that talk about things like, um, you know, risks associated with the use of infusion pumps patient and clinician risks, uh, risks in manufacturing, et cetera. Use the open source data that you have available to you to help develop your risk management program um, and start there in being a little bit more aggressive in collecting your own historical data until you can make an appropriate shift. Uh, just make sure that the open source data that you use is reliable, okay? Mm -hmm. So um, probably not Wikipedia or general Google search, uh, but something definitely more peer-reviewed or coming from one of the regulatory agencies is probably way more reliable for you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for this uh, great tip. And uh, thank you also for your contribution, uh, which was uh, very insightful, uh, Ricky. Um, do you wish to give a last takeaway to our audience? Um, yeah. Risk. Commensurate with risk in all things. And quite honestly, if you can think about that, and everything you do in quality, it'll help you manage your resources and it will drive really, really good decisions when you're thinking about the risk to the patient and the product. After all, we all work to serve the patient. So uh, thank you for having me. It's been very enjoyable. I hope everybody uh, gains a lot from your presentations this, this week. Okay, thank you. And I wish you a very pleasant day. Bye, Ricky. Thank you. Bye-bye.